God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. God, you are good. I need help. 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 So do they. So do they. So do they. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a series on prayer for people who struggle to pray. Seems to me that all the prayers of the Bible can be reduced down to one simple sentence. And when we spend a few moments each day, just a few minutes, following the principles of this simple prayer, those minutes become your best minutes. Just ten minutes becomes your best ten minutes of your day. The prayer is very simple. I'd encourage you to say it aloud with me as the words appear on the screen. God, you are good. I need help. So do they. Thanks. Prayer begins with this simple declaration. God, you're good. The world's bad. My circumstance is bad. Maybe the economy or the weather is bad. Even my health is bad. Again, here in the midst of it all, God, I declare that you are good. Prayer begins with the goodness of God. This was the point of a parable that Jesus taught his disciples. It's recorded in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and thumb your way over to the 18th chapter or turn on your phone or your iPad or whatever mental telepathy you use to read the Bible these days. Luke chapter 18 verse 1. Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never lose hope. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. So she was a widow. That is to say, she was acquainted with grief. She had stood in the soft dirt of a graveyard and bid farewell to someone she loved. The tears, the sadness, the brokenness, she knew it all. She knew the fear of facing life alone. And she had an enemy. A bill collector, an angry landlord, uh, some form of oppressor. We're not told who, but she had an enemy. Someone resolved to take her to the cleaners. And so she begged for mercy and pleaded for leniency, but no luck. So she took her case to the local authority, a judge. Jesus described this judge as a complete scoundrel. In one terse sentence, he did not respect God or care about people. Isn't that a great description of somebody? He did not respect God and he did not care about people. He owned a gated mansion in the Hamptons. His swimming pool was shaped like a dollar sign. He smoked Cubans. He wore Xenia. He drove a Porsche Carrera Coupe. And the Porsche Carrera Coupe had a, dry, had a license plate that had two words on it, my way. He was on the payroll of every mafia boss and drug dealer on the eastern seaboard. They kept him in office. He kept them out of jail. They gave him votes. He gave them a free walk. It was sweet. He was a crook. He was an, he was an unjust judge. His co-workers knew it. 
His kids knew it. His priest knew it. His wife knew it. God knew it. And he didn't care. There was nothing good in this man. He never gave God a second thought. And he never gave a person a second chance. Certainly not a person like the widow. I have nicknamed her Ethel. She has a homely look about her. She wears her hair tied up in a bun. She wears a plaid dress. And old jogging shoes that appear to have been retrieved from a garbage bin. If the judge is a Cadillac, she is a clunker. But boy, for an old clunker, she sure has horsepower. Every morning when the judge steps out of the limo, there she is standing on the sidewalk of the courthouse. Can I have a minute of your time, Your Honor? When he exits his chambers, there she is, Ethel, standing in the hallway. I just need a minute. I have a request, Your Honor. Once on his Saturday morning golf game, she emerged from the bushes on the fourth green. <laughs> she interrupted his putt. Your Honor, I have a request. Ethel pestered him. Ethel pestered his wife. She pestered his secretary. Do something about Ethel, they demanded of the judge. She is driving us local. It got to the point where the judge would have to send his bodyguards ahead of himself when he left to go home at the end of the day just to see if he could get from the courthouse to the limo without being interrupted. One particular day they gave him the thumbs up. He ran from his office to the limo, jumped in the back seat, and guess who was there? <laughs> Ethel was in the back seat. He was trapped. He looked at her and he sighed and he said, Lady, you just don't get it, do you? I don't care about you. And I don't respect God. That's who I am. She looked at him. And she held her thumb from her forefinger just about a quarter of an inch. And she said, oh, your honor, just a small request. Just a tiny, tiny, tiny request. That's all I have. And he clenched his teeth. And he said, all right, anything. Tell me, what do you want? Just to be rid of you. In the next paragraph, she spilled out a story that included words like widow and broke and eviction notice. He didn't even look at her as she spoke. He just stared out the car window at the passing traffic until finally when she paused for a breath, he gave her the timeout sign. He said, all right, I'll, I'll take care of you. But it's not because I like you and it's not because I want to. In fact, I'll only help you on one condition. She said, anything, Your Honor. He said that you get out of my life. That you leave me alone. She said, absolutely. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> he said, no way. She gave him one anyway. And she jumped out of the car and skipped down the sidewalk. And his chauffeur closed the door and the judge rode away. And she's happy and he's relieved and we're confused. What in the world is this story doing in the Bible? Is there anything redemptive in this story? A corrupt judge? A persistent gadfly? Reluctant benevolence? No genuine concern, no love, dishonesty. Why is this story in the Bible? Is there a message in this parable? Yes, there is. It pays to pester. <laughs> it pays to pester. 
God heeds the person who won't leave him alone. Just be a pain in the neck of God. Be a pain in his neck. Just drive him crazy. He doesn't want to hear from you. He doesn't care about you. But if you just keep pestering him, you just keep bothering him, you just keep knocking on his door, that someday he just has to break down and do what he wants with great disrelish. He finally does what he wants just to be rid of you. That's the message of this parable. Really. Really. But that's not the way the Bible describes God. That's not the way the Bible describes the nature. Amen to that. Amen. Yeah, that youngster, he knows the answer when he hears one. And the Bible says that when it comes to prayer, that God's there listening. For all who pray and mean it. The Bible says that the Lord is, is not far from any of us. The Bible gives the promise that if, that if you draw near to God, he, he will draw near to you. The Bible doesn't present God as an unjust judge. Our God is not a Scrooge. You don't have to coerce him. You don't have to twist his arm. You don't have to pester him. Why, Jesus categorically states that God will give good things to those who ask him. Well, then how do we interpret this parable? In the Bible, in the New Testament, there are parables of comparison, like the prodigal son and the lost coin and the lost sheep. But there are also parables of contrast in which when we see the characters, we see not who God is, but who God is not. And not who we are, but who we are not. This is a parable of contrast. Have you ever driven on a bumpy, chug-hole-filled dirt road for 60 miles, shakes your dentures loose until finally... You drive from the dirt road onto the blacktop, the pavement, and you go, whew, what a contrast. Jesus gives us five verses of bumpy roads. And then in verse 6, highway. The Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he, language of contrast, even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God, can you hear the language of contrast? Insinuated, don't you think by contrast that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. For five verses, we saw humanity at its worst. Suffering widow, a corrupt judge, a judge who grouses, who murmurs, who complains. But even he ends up rendering a just verdict. Jesus says, how much more would God, who is good to the core, in whom there is no darkness, in whom there is no variance, who is not moody, who is not cranky, who is not ticked off at his universe, who does not ever wake up on the wrong side of the bed. How much more would God, who is good, not do what is right for his children who cry out to him? Or as another translation reads, God will always give what is right to his people who cry out to him night and day. He will not be slow to answer them. I tell you, God will help his people quickly. You see, you are not the widow. And she was at the end of the rope. And you're at the beginning, you're at the, you're at the front of the line. And she was marginalized and excluded. You're a child of God. 
You've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He knows you by name. You're not the widow. By contrast, you're just the opposite. And God is not the judge. Jesus says God will always give. Always. He hears you every time you pray. He responds every time you make a request. He does not send his angels ahead like bodyguards clearing the path, hoping that you're not on the sidewalk. Just the opposite. He waits for you to speak to him. I don't know if there's anyone in your life who just loves to hear your voice. But God does. He loves to hear your voice. He loves it when you talk to him. Would you receive that? Would you receive it down deep in your heart? Just say it to yourself. God loves it when I talk to him. You don't have to convince him. He's not going to say come back tomorrow. You don't have to get on his schedule. He will always give, Jesus says. He will always give you his attention. He will always give you his time. Jesus says he will always give what is right. Isn't this a mark of a good parent? A good parent always gives what is right. Does a good parent always give what the child wants? Or what the child prefers? Or what the child requests? Not necessarily. This is no mystery, right? When the six-year-old says, Daddy, can I drive the car? What does the good daddy say? No. He gives what is right. This is the statement of Jesus. It's almost a definitive statement about prayer. God will always give what is right. Why? Because he's good. Prayer begins with the goodness of God. Prayer does not begin with the eloquence of the prayer. Or the righteousness of the one who says the prayer. Prayer begins with the goodness of God. If prayer is powerful, it is because God is powerful. If prayer makes a difference, it is because God wants to make a difference. If your prayer is good, it is because God is good. Prayer begins with the character or the goodness of God. So everything hinges on this question. Is God good? Is God good? Prayer in the Bible is not is not a form of personal meditation where you consult yourself. Prayer in the Bible is not a self-help pep talk where you dig deep to find some inner strength. Prayer is not self-medication. Not self-meditation. But prayer is a conversation with a living God. So the question is, what is the nature of the God who hears us? If prayer depends upon Him and His responsiveness to me, everything hinges on this question. Is God the unjust God? who turns people away, who doesn't care? If so, why pray? But if God, by contrast, is a good God who always gives what is right to His people, always gives what is right to His people, who cry out to Him day and night, who responds to them quickly, then for heaven's sake, Let's pray. That's why the Bible is so insistent that we understand the heart of God. And that's why I think this invitation 
is in the book of Psalms. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He could have said, taste and see that the Lord is wise, that the Lord is strong, that the Lord is mighty. But he wants us to begin with the goodness of God. Taste and see. Boy, I love that invitation, taste and see. I love to taste things. I'm a good taster. In fact, when my wife goes to the grocery store, I love to go with her, not really to help her shop, but because I love it when they give those samples. <laughs> those samples. You know what I'm talking about? I go into the grocery store just looking for the sample table. And when I find one, I just migrate. I, I just hover around it like a bass around a hook in the water. I just swim and swim until finally the person says, Oh, sir, come and taste and see that the bluebell is good. Come and taste and see that the Oreos are good. Come and taste. I don't have to be invited twice. I love to taste and see. Your heavenly Father has thrown open the pantry of His kindness and issued this invitation. Oh, come and taste and see how good God is. Have you accepted His invitation? Taste and see. Every page of your Bible says, taste and see how good God is. How good of God to create a garden that was seven times declared good for Adam and Eve. Taste and see how good of God to give Abraham a new land, a new life. Taste and see how good of God to give Joseph a place where he could protect his family for centuries to come. How good of God God to give Moses the ability to lead the people out of the ch land of Egypt to give Joseph the promised land taste and see how good of God to give David those psalms to write to give David the second chance in life how good of God taste and see how good of God to keep Esther strong to give Nehemiah the skill to protect Ruth in a foreign land every page of the Bible taste and see how good of Jesus Christ to be born in a manger to be placed in a feed trough to grow up in Nazareth Taste and see the wine that the wedding didn't have. The fish that Peter said he could not catch. The buffet for thousands the disciples said they could not provide. Taste and see the forgiveness at the foot of the cross. The power of in resurrection garden taste and see how good God is prayer begins with the goodness of God before you make your requests before you list your complaints before you confess your sins take a few moments and inhale inhale the goodness of God. The psalmist said, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. If your life seems too bad, then stop and inhale God's goodness. That's simple. Wherever you are, when the traffic is bad, God is good. When the economy is bad, God is good. When the husband is bad, God is good. When the kids are bad, God is good. We, you just keep, God, you're good. 
You're good. You're good. What you don't want to do is allow your life to be consumed by all that is bad. And it's easy to do. But you're not just any person, are you? You're not the widow, marginalized and forgotten. You're a child of God. And at any point during your day, your best minutes are those minutes that you look up and you say, you know, God, you're good. This is what the Barone family has done now for many years. If you were here in December, maybe you remember I introduced you to Christoph and Joy Barone. They have three children, Chloe and Annie and Elliot. And in the summer of 1995, their world was changed. They took their family on a family vacation to Colorado and while the parents and the grandparents were checking the family into a cabin they left the kids in the car the kids at that time were ages six four and two somehow the car slipped out of gear and the SUV began rolling down a road toward a cliff the parents and the grandparents ran as fast as they could. The fastest runner was Joy, the mom. She couldn't get the passenger door open, so she did the unthinkable. She ran around in front of the vehicle, put her hands out as if to stop it. And to this day, Chloe and Annie, the older two daughters, can remember the bump as the car ran over her body. It slowed the car down just enough for the grandfather to reach the passenger side where he threw open the door and jumped in head first, hand on the brake, and stopped the car. The children survived. Joy, the mother, was paralyzed. Unless Jesus chooses to heal her she'll spend the rest of her life in a wheelchair but she tells her children that she would do it all over again for the joy of having her family safe she lives up to her name joy does there's no bitterness you don't you don't detect any sourness when you talk to her just happiness I think I know her secret. She calls it the good book. Not the Bible, that is the good book too. But there's another good book in the lives, the family of the Verone family. When she came home from the hospital and her children were all small, the family reeling from this adjustment to mom in a wheelchair, She would have the children each evening contribute their thoughts into a journal. And they compiled two lists. A list of bad things and a list of good things. The bad things that came out of that accident, they would list them. But after they wrote down all the bad things, she would say, okay, children, what are some good things? And they would make a list. And the children will tell you that they realized that there was more good than bad. That as they began making a list, yes, of the blessings that came out of that tragedy, that list overcame the length of the other list. And Joy taught her family how to find God's goodness even in the midst of a bad tragedy. Friend, you can do this. There's no page in the Bible that tells you you will be spared and exempt from any bad things. But every page of the Bible tells you that God works through all the bad things to do good things. 
because he at his heart is a good God. You are not the widow. You're the child of God. He's not the stubborn, resistant judge. He is the good God who gives good things to all his children. And he invites you to taste and see that he is good. And he leaves you with this promise, Jesus says, that he will always do what is right to his people who cry out to him day and night. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We needed the reminder today that this world is overseen by a good heart. We needed to be reminded today that our prayers do not fall on deaf ears or disappear in some mail room. We needed to be reminded today, Lord, that when we cry, you notice, and when we pray, you listen. And even when we make foolish requests, you do what is right because you are a good God. And we thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said,